Yeah, I'm in uh, in Newport, uh, Rhode Island. Um, That's nice. Which is uh, a, an interesting place. I, uh, more and more, I'm convinced that uh, this is uh, what uh, Lovecraft was really talking about when he referred to witch hunt in Arkham. <laughs> you know, the, you know, it's like little town north of Providence. Uh, that's really weird. Lots of rich people that have, you know, checkered pasts. <laughs> Totally. Ooh, can we talk about that some more? I love Providence and Lovecraft, and I love what you're saying. I think that makes perfect sense. Yeah, the uh, I've always uh, liked the idea of uh, uh, traveling to some place and then uh, you know being someplace notorious for a while. So uh, so it's like. Yeah, he lived in New Orleans for a while, and then he <laughs> moved, to, you know, whatever that kind of thing. But, um, but, but yeah, the, I, I think that, and especially lately, I've gotten interested in uh, some of the uh, stuff that I knew nothing about, like the roots of occult America, that uh, have, have recently been gaining popularity in, st in academic study. Uh, uh, I know. Um, uh, Justin Sledge had a video about uh, uh, this new research that like uh, Cotton Mather had the first uh, copy of the Kabbalah in, in the in the United States or stuff like that. Or, you know, um, the uh, Governor Winthrop uh, of Connecticut was an alchemist, <laughs> you know, and the stuff like that. It's like, why didn't wow. they ever, all I ever got in, in introduction to American literature was sinners in the hands of an angry God and read Moby Dick. You know, that was it. <laughs> no, totally. And why do they consistently cut this out? Like of all of history. And like when they do recognize that people have these things like maybe in ancient Greece, they, they disown or discount like the magical parts or like, oh, this person worked with, you know, Hecate or something like that. They just are like, oh, but that's just poppycock. You know, that's silly, but we're only going to focus on their philosophical ideas. But like that was part of their worldview as well. So whether you believe it's a real goddess or it's just a, you know, something that people project, like you said in one of your recent subsect articles, like doesn't really matter, but you still have to take the person's kind of worldview into consideration and not just like, cherry pick this little part out i feel like well and i think that uh what uh, started this uh, recent well fairly recently uh in academia anyway uh because uh, in in comparative religion there's always been the struggle you know back and forth we knew that the gnostics existed we knew all these the neoplatonists but uh they uh you know how do you address them and they're very very specialized but in art uh, there was just this blanket, you know, oh, no, the surrealists, eh, they were just uh, doing some funky stuff uh, that had nothing to do with occultism. Um, and I uh, I do think the Helmhoff Clint exhibits uh, it really sort of touched off the, oh, yeah, we're allowed to talk about this, that some of these paintings were channeled or, you know, at least spiritually influenced and made oh, for yeah, a temple well, that she wanted to build. Mm -hmm, right yeah <laughs> or you know the, the, all those surrealists in Paris were hanging out with all those occultists in Paris and sometimes they were the same people you know <laughs> and uh, uh, all, all of that uh, I, I think that um, Hanegraaff's uh, term rejected religion or you know the, this uh, you know stuff that uh, you know, that, that has been purposefully erased um, because we, we just don't want to deal with it because it's not part of the enlightenment. It's not part of this uh, positivist thinking. Um, but uh, but we've always had, and you know, I think that the, the idea that the irrational has no place in, uh, in academic study is a relatively modern one. Uh, I mean, you know, it's, if you look at, uh, there's a book that I loved uh, as an undergrad called The Greeks and the Irrational. Uh, and, uh, it, it was one of those books that I just found by chance, you know, <laughs> you know, like in the Perfect. library, you're, you're walking around and you're it's like you're looking at something else. It's like, wow, what's this? And uh, and it was all about how um, it, this is an understudied aspect of Greek culture is that, you know, the, their reliance on the irrational of these, you know, you know, 
Bakke and you know these Dionysian uh, trends that uh, that were very important in Greek life, but we're, we do, we just kind of choose to focus on oh this philosophy is you know very uh, you know pl Platonic Aristotelian uh, you know idea of uh, you know you have uh, this is what you study A is always A and stuff like that and uh, it has to be logically proven, but that that wasn't it that wasn't all of it you know. <laughs> It's an incomplete picture. No, it's absolutely not all of it. And then cutting out these big parts really changes what you're saying. Hold on mm -hmm. a second. What do you want, Linnea? Great. Carl just got back, so that won't happen again. <laughs> As Hi, we God. were saying. <laughs> yeah, I told him I was doing a podcast with you. So he also says, hi. Hi. <laughs> You can, you can tell Carl he is the only human being I am genuinely jealous of. Why for? <laughs> well, I mean, well, not a. I mean, just what he's done in his life, and you know, his abilities as a writer, as an artist, and who he's met, and everything. And he's got you. I mean, so you know, he's, he's, he's pretty cool. He's very aspirational. You know, it's a S tier, as they say. <laughs> I have to say too, coming to Sweden. And seeing how Sweden is has actually made my respect for Carl grow like infinitely because Swedes are not like Carl. Like he like, re like this is not like meeting Anton LaVey and stuff in America. You know, this is like Sweden <laughs> is like, they're like, even though they're like liberal, like they don't mind you being gay and things like that. They're pretty conservative of like how you're supposed to be, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's like uh, the fact that he was doing that and like, like, uh, he just wrote this magical autobiography that's uh, going to be on Intertitions next year. And, like, like David Lagenkrantz, like, did an article on him when he was, like, you know, 20 or something. And the title of it for the newspaper was, like, Satan's son lives in Ostermom, which is, like, <laughs> like you know, the Upper East Side or something. Or Newport, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, <laughs> Satan's son lives there, you know what I mean? And it's, like, that's pretty hardcore in, like, you know, 1989, you know, <laughs> like, yeah, so I have like more respect for Carl actually now than I ever did before, even though I had a lot before. It's just like uh, <laughs> mind blowing because it's not easy to break out in Sweden, I don't think. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I also, I, I mean, I, I lived through the satanic panic and being a good Dungeons and Dragons player and, you know, listening to the wrong kind of music and all that stuff so in Laredo, Texas, which right. is, uh, yeah, a pretty. Uh, <laughs> conservative area of, of the country but although it's funny because um where i grew up uh it wasn't really the deep south because it was more influenced by the uh, by being the proximity to mexico you know it was a border border mm -hmm. town thank and, goodness uh, yeah <laughs> and, and, and so it, it had a lot of what uh, a friend of mine who was a catholic brother uh referred to as pagan leftovers uh, you know, where, you know, you'd have like lots of synchronicities or, uh, or uh, not synchronicities, syncretic uh, behavior. Uh, so you have, you know, the saints, you know, so, oh, this is a statue of St. Jude with the, with the baby Jesus and the baby Jesus is removable. So uh, you say, now give me what I want, St. Jude, or, and, and, and I'll give you the baby Jesus back or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> that kind, of, kind of thing, you know, and so, um yeah, it was, it was, it's a, a a weird place to grow up. But uh, looking back on it, I, I kind of uh, feel fortunate because it was just a just so bizarre in many ways. And uh, and not, you know, the world is very homogenized now. Uh, it, it's getting harder and harder to find pockets of weirdness. I mean, 20 years ago when I when I went to UT in Austin, you know, they still had the Keep Austin Weird uh, stickers, but it, at the same time, everybody knew it was less weird than it had been 20 years before, you know, and uh, there at a lot of that, I think, especially uh, the, you know, the people complain about social media, but it's really, uh, th things things come to a level. There's a little homophobia stage. It's like enough people get on to uh, and, and any platform, including democracy. And there's, <laughs> there, there's this uh, idea that, you know, it's like, well, yeah, if everybody's represented, everybody's represented. And uh, th that means that there's going to be uh, a dilution 
of the, you know the principles that were there and so you know what you give up with uh, exclusivity you make up for in i don't know boy, vox populi I, I i don't know it's it's a it's a it's a hard needle to thread absolutely no and i feel very similarly about growing up in miami because even though like florida is like in the south and definitely mm -hmm. has a lot of backwards aspects Miami is like you know very multicultural and every, most people there are from you know the Caribbean or South America and like 89 percent of people speak Spanish you know so it's right. like not really like uh, other places in the U.S. so I feel like also when I hear all the different debates going on in the U.S. I don't like resonate with them because I feel like where I grew up was not I don't know it just it wasn't the same kind of makeup of like the population and and it's just yeah it's its own thing and there was definitely a lot of like santeria and voodoo and we have little haiti and there's all sorts of fun stuff going on yeah that's that's the thing you know it's the, it, it, not, nothing is a monolith especially states in the u.s where you know you have these little microcultures uh, like i uh, tell someone it's like well you're moving to austin you're not really moving to texas uh you know it's not the mm -hmm. same thing but if you drive, you know, 10 miles outside of Austin, you, you, yeah, that's Texas, you know, uh, but uh, <laughs> it, 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 same thing. It's like, you know, when I was growing up and, you know, up until the late 70s, early 80s, I would say, uh, the the south of Texas was staunchly Democratic um, because, uh, it, you know, it was LBJ territory. Um and it, it wasn't really until Reagan uh, that, uh, that 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 the things started changing, and most of that uh, had to do with, uh, I mean, really deceptive issues. You know, people were voting against their own interests uh, because they believed this this idea of like, oh yeah, it's a new day for America or whatever, or we have to. You know, it, 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 it it's odd. I I I do think there's. Uh, you know, Mitch Horowitz talked a lot about Re Reagan uh, being, you know, uh, a positive thinker and, you know, he, he using all this kind of new age terminology uh, with it, within his speeches. And I think there was something to that. I think that uh, uh, there was um, a glamour, a kind of spell that he had uh, that, that uh, you know, or his marketers had. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, as, as, and you, you, see, you see the kind of the, the logical extension of that and people like trump you know who have this kind of like you know ability to outwardly lie and accuse other people of what they themselves are guilty of with no shame no no problem oh my God. Uh, and it, it's it, and it comes back to this glamour this kind of you know they called reagan the teflon president because nothing would stick to him and uh, and, and now it's it, it's just become exacerbated and uh it's uh yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe not the the best Fourth of July conversation. Yeah, maybe the perfect Fourth of July conversation. <laughs> uh, it, 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 it's it, it's so easy to get so depressed just listening to the news. Now I, I I found that I have to limit my intake of news. You know, it's like you know uh, I'll do like morning edition or all things because they're like 15 minutes of npr and that's about it <laughs> you know because if i if i spend uh, you know, too much time doom scrolling or whatever it's it, it's not good um and it's hard because there are so many things that are news and um you know we had uh three mass shootings in the last two days and it's like that's no longer even news really it's just yeah that's mm -hmm. what happens but uh, th that's not what what always happened and it's not like it, it hasn't always been this way and it's only very recently that it's been this way and uh you know it's it's like i, I feel sorry for all those kids that were born after 9 11 mm -hmm. uh because they never knew a country before the patriot act uh before yeah, that was before. yeah nor or columbine or any of those things you know and so um the, it's and I, I feel very old sometimes. <laughs> well, you grew up without the internet. That makes us dinosaurs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I remember the utter pain of having to try to do footnotes on a typewriter. Oh, 
Remember oh. that? Like, you, you know, you'd, you'd scroll it and, and you know, inevitably. That I did not have and, to do. <laughs> uh, well, then, then MLA <laughs> saved my life with EndNotes because I, okay, EndNotes. And, and then where and then WordStar came along and it's like, I'm never going back. I'm never touching a typewriter again. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like, but, uh, but yeah, there it's, it, it, you know, these kids today. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> they don't understand. But we're totally, we're gonna, we're like, yeah, you don't even know it's comparable people that grew up without cars versus with cars, maybe. But like, yeah, without internet versus with internet, it's like two totally different universes. Well, it's funny. Uh, there's um, the guy that wrote the information. I can't think of his name right now, but he talked about how the most displaced worker in history was the horse. Uh, and, uh, specifically in, in England uh, around the time of World War One, I, I think. Before World War One, there were lots of horses. After World War One, not so many horses. <laughs> you know, it's like all these things got taken over by machine power, like, you know, by cars or whatever. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and, you know, now that I think the, the, there's so many things that are going on that are unraveling as we look at them. Like AI is is a, a big one. It's like you know the the I and the bigger questions behind it of aesthetics and authenticity. Uh, what what is going to be real? Uh, what, what is a real piece of art? Uh, you know, the the latest version of Photoshop uh, has a, a, an AI feature built in where you can just say, "Can you make the clouds look darker?" You, you can type it in, and it'll do it. It figures it out. It figures, finds the sky and it finds the clouds and it adjusts that. It's like, you know, uh, and, and so there's really no limit to what you can create. And I've gotten into photography lately and, uh, but not so much into the post process. And maybe this is why people like film photography so much now and why it's a, it, it during a resurgence because mm -hmm. it feels more authentic. It feels nostalgia is the word that people use all the time, but, uh, but maybe there's a, a certain yearning for authenticity, you know, for something real, something you can touch, you know, you get back the pictures from the lab or whatever. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Carl's just started recently shooting on film again, like last week, I would say, mm. <laughs> because there's a guy in town who has a Photoshop and he can develop it there, especially black and white. Yeah, I, I actually uh, went through an infatuation with film uh, a few years ago when I was in Texas. I, I set up not really a dark room, but I had the chemicals to do developing and then uh, yeah, I could scan because you don't really need an enlarger anymore. You, you, as long as you, you have the scans at a flatbed scanner, you can you, you take it from there. But um, uh, 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 moving to the Northeast, it's all packed up in a little box because I didn't have a place to have a light proof room, you know, which is just pretty important. And, uh, mm. but, but, and I shoot almost entirely digital now, but, but I find that um, at the same time, you know, the, there's all the cliche about anything can be a mystical exercise or esoteric, you know, it's like when you walk, walk or whatever. But photography teaches you a lot about things like, you know, how you see the world, you know, perspective. Uh, you know, for, I, I found out that my favorite focal lengths, uh, you know, everybody, should, uh, that's well, people on YouTube that uh, do street photography or whatever, they use 35 millimeter lenses or close up lenses. And I prefer law, like telephoto lenses, uh, you know. Uh, 150 millimeters is the kind of my sweet spot or somewhere around there but uh, you know because I don't like to be right up close I, I tend to look at things further away and you know I, I think about that uh, you know why what is what is that perception uh, if preferring far away to nearness you know what, what mm -hmm. does that mean or what why 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 is my brain built like that <laughs> yeah it's yeah. super interesting and all of these all the ways that we each do things a little differently all come from somewhere. That's why I love psychoanalysis. This is like uh, you can end up figuring out a little bit of how all these things are pieced together. And that's why I always hope that people don't pathologize the way they do things as opposed to the way someone else does. Because it's all like you've developed that way for a reason. Even if you don't understand the reason, you don't have to. Just like, you know, trust that you're working just fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, it it is it is funny uh you know when you you know psychology is, is 
you know, my undergrad is in psychology. And I, at one time, I really thought of going into it until I figured out that, you know, I don't have the patience for it, basically. <laughs> um, but, uh, but I still find it very interesting. And when, uh, when you talk about, you know, psychology and the occult, I, I find that, uh, you know, there, there's this kind of split. So there's the the, the, the traditional analyst, uh, Freudian, Jungian types. They're, they're okay with that. You know, it's like, yeah, there's parts of the mind we don't understand. And, you know, we, we can use these various uh, terms, terms to at least talk about these things. And then there's the no, no, this is uh, all uh, part of, you know, evolutionary psychology. The, you know, you, nothing is real. Uh, which in its own way is a mystical statement, you know, like when you say that reality, uh, you know, uh, I just finished reading um, uh, The Case Against Reality, uh, mm. a good book, I highly recommend it, but, the, you know, the guy goes into um, how, you you know, nothing you see is actually real, it's, it, you know, it's, it's interpreted by the mind, you know, or by the brain or whatever, mm -hmm. Um so you don't uh, you don't see your nose if, unless you actually look for it on your face, that kind of thing. And uh, uh, but uh, his argument is that we're evolutionarily built for uh, to not to see the world as it is, but as a kind of user interface, so that uh, we can uh, we can uh, make use of the world in a mm -hmm. in a better way. So it's a it's the it, it's a way that'll keep you alive rather than what how it really is. And totally. that's an interesting uh, way to look at it. That's totally true. And I like both these books now. I'm going to look them up because these <laughs> both sound like really interesting books. Um, no, and it's totally true because, you know, they say like, you know, when you ride your bike down the street or something like that, like your mind actually can see like every address and like everything that is it scanning as you're going. But like, you can't take in all of that information, you know, we'd all be like completely insane, you know, so you have to like filter and just like take in what's useful for you, like you're saying, and the same thing coming from the inside, from the unconscious, like there's so much stored in your unconscious. It's like, like everything you've ever done is in there. We can't remember that all the time, but like it's in there, you know? So like you have to have this sort of interface filtration system in order to function in the world. Yeah. And uh, there's this uh, uh, book I read recently about uh, aging in the mind that talked about uh, fluid memory versus uh, crystallized memory. You know, that's like, you know, that you get frustrated when you're older because you can't think as fast. But part of that is because you have so much to sort through. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's like you have a bigger library. It's going to take you longer to find the book, you know, that kind of thing. Totally. Uh, so, you know, the author gives an example of like, you're frustrated because you can't remember someone's name. But then all of a sudden, when you do remember their name, all these other associations come along with us. Like, oh, yeah, I knew the person in high school. Or I know, know his best friend's mother or whatever, that kind of thing. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Super interesting. See, that's why I love doing this podcast. You never know where you're <laughs> going to end up. <laughs> uh, uh, but but yeah, I, 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 I do hope that... Um, the, the, that one area that uh, that occultism or or academic study of occultism goes into a little bit is, is psychology because I, I do think there's there's a, there's certainly fertile fields there you know everything from you know cognitive science life of the mind uh, you know that kind of thing to I mean well Jung's kind of a chapter onto himself and you know I I, I remember I I had a friend visit and. Uh, uh, I, show, I was showing her the library and uh, it showed her the oversized books that we had a copy of Jung's Red Book and mm. the, book, the big full size version. It's like, it's like, yeah, nothing makes it, nothing uh, hits as hard as they say uh, as as you know a real print book that's a huge size. It, it feels uh, special somehow in a way that looking at it as screen just doesn't. You know, and there's this. Uh, uh, and all those things are, you know, how do you quantify that? You know, there, there is, I mean, it's, it's very hard to quantify something like that. Um, but there's a, but that's the, in, in libraries, we have that problem all the time where how much do you preserve if you're, if you're digitizing something, how well can you describe it? And truthfully, the answer is not very well at all uh, for 90% of stuff. It's like, it's a book. It's, uh, it's got this many pages and, you know, maybe, you know, you copy something, but 
um, the guy who wrote uh, The Social Life of Information, whose name I can't remember now. Sorry, that's the way my mind works. I remember things, but I don't remember names. Okay. <laughs> but he was talking about uh, being in the French archive, uh, doing some research, uh, you know, the National Library of France. And there was this guy sitting down the table uh, down the row for him. And he had a box of letters from the Napoleonic era. And he was smelling them like <laughs> and you know you think about an archive and how musty it is already and this this poor guy is like what are you doing and uh and finally he couldn't contain himself anymore so he went, walked over and asked him okay what are you doing it turned out the guy was an epidemiologist he was doing historical research on instances of the plague in Nepal wow. Napoleonic era France and the reason he was smelling the letters was because it was common practice in those days if a village had plague they would douse the mail before before sending it off in brandy because that was mm -hmm. the only disinfectant they had and so they they would be, so after all these years you could still smell a little bit of the brandy in the wow. letter and so he could figure out okay which villages had plague and which ones didn't based on the smell of the letters that's something you could never digitize or you could you could never uh you would never even think to do that it's like uh, the, it's just some psycho that ca came up with this uh, brilliant idea that uh you know but but that's that's why we preserve things and why there are originals and then the digital facsimiles are great but sometimes uh you need to go back to the original absolutely and i feel like definitely they're useful now like they're definitely useful for all of us to have all of this digitized but i'm not sure that that's gonna have great longevity in the end at the end of the day whereas the physical objects have a little bit more chance i feel of being around somewhere for someone some kind of being to find in the future perhaps <laughs> well yeah i mean you know it's, it's like you, you need a uh you know just how many word perfect files no longer exist because nobody yeah reads exactly or whatever yeah i i was thinking about this about um bookstores you know when i was a kid you know you, you know you you looked at a bookstore and you got what was there you know you, you, you it, i had no idea what other books existed other than what was in the library or in the bookstore there was no internet mm -hmm. so yeah I'll, I'll, I, you know and i've been trying to uh again yeah, kind of lessen my library my personal library down and i find these books that's like why did i buy this crap it's like well there was nothing else on the subject at the time you know it's like you know and uh it's not like today where you can find everything on Amazon or, you know, if you're looking for, you know, uh, something uh, fairly unusual, it's probably on the Internet Archive or on uh, mm -hmm. or somewhere digitized. And it's like it's so easy to find. But but that, it was that's just a very, very recent development. And I, I don't know if uh if I were growing up, uh, I, I, I assume that the people that are getting into a cult nowadays and at a young age have better resources because they can find all this stuff. But at the same time, there's so much stuff that how do you narrow it down? How do you figure out, you know, what, what to what to study or, or, you know, because everything's interesting. Uh, you know, it's like, you know, it's like, you know, yeah, uh, you can find a copy of the Corpus Hermeticum just fine. Uh, but how are you going to put that in context? Uh, what what are you going to read to, uh, you know, uh, it's like, oh, I'm interested in this Neoplatonism thing. Where do you start? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, uh, or, you know, Kabbalah, the old thing was, you know, it's like, well, you get to a certain point and you got to learn Hebrew. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, there's no way around it. And, uh, and so, you know, I, I I really uh, wonder, you know, what I I think that uh, you know for the modern era, chaos magic is the only thing that will make sense long term, just because everything else has fallen apart. And you know, I I, I like to study it for historical reasons, but you know, I'm not going to uh, use a golden dawn ritual in everyday life. I don't have access to a lodge or, you know, that kind of a full temple structure and, and all that stuff. And I'm not sure it would be all that helpful anyway. Uh, so I don't know. 
No, totally. I think chaos magic is the magic for our times. It's like the most accessible and you can kind of DIY it and um, pull from a bunch of different sources and kind of make your create your own way. Carl's, Carl's idea is that like all of these different systems are meant like you learn them only so that you can overcome them and like not need them anymore you know so he like went through a bunch of different systems and initiations and things and now he's at a point where he's like actively left these different kind of organizations and just like you know doing his own thing and I feel like yeah at the end of the day like definitely structures like same with psychoanalytic training like there's a point in your life where you kind of need a structure and like people to show you what to read for example what should what point you in a direction but then at some point you should uh, come to start thinking on your own where you don't need to like just be regurgitating what the master said or like following their system like young I think is also a perfect example like he his kind of version of psychoanalysis is so different than Freud's in the end. You know, he made something that he needed to like work through to work through his own stuff. And I think it's great that people study Jung. And of course, you can use his system if you want. But I think at the end of the day, it's like a good model for what to do. Like you at the end of the day have to create kind of your own way of being in the world. And it's not going to be exactly like Freud's or Jung's or Lacan's or, you know, Levy's or whatever. It's going to be your own kind of um take on it yeah and I, I i totally agree because you know the if you ever want to i mean the things that mess with my head are I, i'll try to reread something that i found really interesting when i was 18 or 19 years old I, oh, you know, yeah. that's uh, always weird yeah <laughs> it's like, boy what? i was really into Dion fortune wasn't i <laughs> that kind of thing it's like <laughs> and it's not that there isn't any value it like i, I was uh, reading a life as levy uh, uh you know maybe six months ago uh because I, I, I hadn't read it in a long time and it, it's like yeah this is kind of boring actually <laughs> You know, he's a, he's a, I mean, he, he, he was a good writer for his time, but he sounds so Victorian. And he sounds so dated nowadays. And it's not that it isn't good, but there was a time I attached a certain romanticism to that. Uh, it's like, oh, yeah, I, I think that uh, certain writers have a charm because they sound Victorian or whatever. But then when you're not reading it for the charm, but you're actually trying to get ideas from it, it, it gets in the way. It's like, oh, yeah, this is just his way of saying this or that, you know. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Psychoanalysts and occultists both do this. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I, you know, when it's funny because uh, I, I learned much more about Freud uh, doing uh, an English degree than I did in psychology because, you know, it's like we are study criticism and Freudian criticism, you know, it's like, say what you will about the analysis part of it, uh, it, it uh, you know, whether it's good or bad, but it is a very effective way of framing stories and and trying to look at uh, ideas in uh, in myths and stuff like that. So it's like, yeah, I, I could be a Freudian just because, uh, you know, it, it makes sense to me. Uh, but... Uh, and the analysis works great too. You can think of it exactly like that is in that like, you know, we're narrating our own lives and then you can use this lens to kind of look at your narration, like who the, where do these characters came from and <laughs> where did you get these ideas? You know, my, I, somebody once told me years ago that like they studied, it was, they had a philosophy degree, like, oh, and that their teacher said like, oh, this is a great way to like read like critical theory and things through Freudian lens, but like, you know, never, never in practice as an analysis. <laughs> it makes me so used to say sad. I would say even like angry and, and like really, really sad <laughs> that teachers are saying that. Like, please don't do that. <laughs> it's a good practice too. <laughs> well, and, and I mean, I, I think that uh, a lot of psychoanalysis and uh, uh, analytic treatment fell out of favor not because it didn't work but because it's so expensive you know compared yeah. to oh yeah take this pill or do some cognitive behavior training for two weeks or whatever you know that kind of thing um it, it's like you know I, I was involved um quite a bit with addiction and recovery uh services i worked for a while and uh, and it's uh it's interesting what insurance companies would and wouldn't pay for 
Mm-hmm. It's like, yes, you 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 can be completely cured in 28 days by going to Charteria Grand Hospital or whatever, and uh, you know, doing this uh, pseudo 12 step program, uh, and uh, you know, and uh, you know, having meetings every day, and then you're cured. That's it. You're done. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it never worked, you know. It's like, it, 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 and, you know, and so mm-hmm. you, you see the the floatsome and jetsam left over from these places, and uh, you know, it's like, and and you'd go back to the insurance company a year later. It's like, oh well, send them back to the treatment center, you know, because they're not going to pay for, you know, what would really help them. And I think that's why programs like AA got so popular because it was basically free treatment or well, free self yeah, free group therapy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> which you know worked better at some places than others it just depended on who was in the group but uh but at least if you followed the framework it, it was yeah it was a reliable way to on a regular basis do some introspection for people that that didn't come naturally to yeah and you could go every day there's always a meeting at any exactly. time of day every day especially if you live in like a city area so it's like something you can do every day to keep on top of it and keep yourself you know in the frame of mind and and, and looking at yourself and doing introspective work which is which is like analysis too it's like something you keep doing regularly no and the institutes you know that do psychoanalytic training don't haven't helped it either because it's also so expensive and time consuming to become an analyst so this is like lesser and lesser and it ends up being like just a, a specific group of people that can afford to do that with their time and their resources and then they only like psychoanalyze the same kind of person you know and then the theory yeah. also becomes about that person and everyone else is like I don't relate to this at all so there's definitely been like a progressive issue but that's why hopefully like people getting away from that more and more and making more of like a psychoanalysis for the people kind of thing where it's like more affordable people can work I think also online it helps a lot because you, you know like me I'm work out of a room in my house now so I don't have to pay for an office so I can offer like better sliding scale and like help people access it better people from rural areas can access it if you, even if there's not an analyst nearby so I think the online thing's going to really help like break through Uh, and make psychoanalysis more popular again hopefully it is already becoming more popular because it really works yeah well (laughs) the the thing is everybody has a therapist in some areas you know like so I I know I know people uh or follow people in Los Angeles you know it's like nobody in Los Angeles doesn't have a therapist I mean it seems like you know it's like you know that's just part of the conversation now whether they're getting uh, a great deal of benefit from that or if it's just a social you know, norm or I, I don't know. But yeah, I, I think there's definitely and the, there there needs to be an outlet for, you know, society is getting so demanding of our attention. Um, and, you know, they call it the attention economy, you know, is like, and so you have these, uh, uh, the, the real, you know, drugs of our time are Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, you know, it's like, it's like you know, these, you know, you keep having to have that dopamine hit of, you know, likes or whatever. Uh, there has to be a, a place where you can just talk to someone one on one and, you know, talk about things that are important. You know, that, that that's the other side of the, you know, we, we live in such a, uh, a lighthearted society, you know, where you don't want to talk about serious things. And if you do, you're, you're considered a bore or whatever, you know, and, uh, I'm always that person at parties where <laughs> people are like, this made a weird directional turn. And I'm like, sorry, <laughs> this conversation went. <laughs> like, yeah, nice, nice artist. Uh, nice, nice art. Did you know he was a cannibal? Uh, yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, uh, yeah, I'm always that person that, you know, that at any party will uh, either leave early or end up with two or three people in a corner somewhere, <laughs> you know, and, um, but, but yeah, I, I don't know, there's, uh, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's got to be an outlet in society, and, uh, and my concern is that the outlets we have aren't very healthy, um, and uh, they're not even very creative. Uh, you know, you 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 look at uh, something like AI again. It's like, you know, how how much do you want to outsource your creativity? 
uh, you know, it's like, yes, uh, Mid Journey can uh, come up with a fabulous uh, painting in 10 seconds and ChatGBT can write. I know somebody who is uh, writing a book with ChatGBT and it's going to be self-published and he's going to sell it on Amazon and stuff. It's like, why? You know, I mean, you're, you're never going to make that much money from it. Why would you claim something that was written almost entirely by an AI as your own work? It, it, it doesn't make any sense to me. It, uh, you know, it's, it's not like if there's monetary reward, I could see, you know, why you would do it. But, you know, as far as artistic merit, you know, claiming something, it just, I don't know, maybe I just don't understand it. I don't get it. Well, I think, yeah, and no, I think a big problem that I see with the internet in general, even though it's very useful and I love a lot of it, is like this passivity where it's like there's no like space to fill like with your imagination or creativity, like you're saying. It's just like kind of passively consuming a lot of information and there's not really like a little lot of activity coming out of people. And I feel like if we lose that kind of drive to like generate and create that's that's a very big problem in general and I feel like psychoanalysis like you said you can carve out this little space for yourself and there's another mm -hmm. person there but it's really for you like carving out this time for yourself where you're just really going to focus on yourself and see what you think and how you're feeling and and not just be like you know constantly passively consuming you know all this advertising and media and other people's opinions and all this other stuff you know you're really just carving out space for yourself I think is so important yeah, and, and and it's and it's definitely one of those things that you know the mind will do what you train it to do, uh, and you know you you become what 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 you do, and so you'll. I notice that a lot of people, you know, uh, it, it seems like everybody has ADHD now, and it, it's, it's like, computers, uh, or or, <laughs> just, uh, uh, or is this just a symptom of our times because? You need to have ADHD in order to keep up with all the stimuli around you. Um, it's it's like the you know thing about uh, you look at a, a kid who's you know got his headphones on the computer and everything. It's like you you can't possibly be studying doing all that. And it's like well no that's not true. It's like it's like I can't possibly be studying. That doesn't mean <laughs> a sixteen year old can't do that because their minds are more fluid, you know, they, and they're used to all and these fragmented. Things. Yeah. But mm. the, 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 the flip side of that is it's very hard for them to concentrate on a single point or, you know, meditate or, like or read a book, read a book. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> see something through to the end, uh, that, that type of thing. And it's like, you know, I'm having a hard time reading books. And I used to read just like for hours, I just sat and read. And now it's like, I have to really be like, okay, now I'm going to read. You know, <laughs> like this is my reading time. Turn everything off. Stay away from the phone. You know, like focus. Uh, but I have to like consciously like retrain myself to be able to read for long periods of time, which is really scary, actually. It's it's funny. I remember there was an interview with Kevin Rose a few years ago. He where he talked about uh, having a Kindle and. And uh, the interviewer says, well, why, you have an iPad. Why don't you just read on that? So, no, man, you don't understand. The iPad's got those angry birds. <laughs> you know, it's like, you, you know, I can't resist reading. those angry birds, you know. <laughs> and uh, and it, it, you, say, you know, the, the lovely thing about a, a book is that it doesn't run out of batteries. And, uh, you know, it, no, there are no pop-up screens. And you can skip over the advertising pretty easily. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. No, and like you said, when it's something, there's something about having a tangible object, but that might just be because we're old. <laughs> Maybe the kids won't care. <laughs> well, well, I, I, I read a lot on a Kindle, but, uh, but it's also because uh, I can't, my, my eyes get strained if I look at a computer screen for a very yeah, long time. Yeah, I can't read on the computer yeah. at all. Yeah, it's, uh, although, have you noticed the intimacy of like there are things that you want to do here with this at this distance as opposed to things that are uh, out there you know like you know something that's televisions uh distant versus computer laptop computer distant 
hey, I'm going to need a lot of different glasses. <laughs> yeah, Carl has like four pairs of glasses. <laughs> Terminal glasses, reading glasses, borrowing glasses. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it's funny because it, it, there, there's a certain... Um, I remember when computers first started coming around the idea was you'd share them because they were so expensive, you know, so you shared time. And, but once uh, iPhones came around, no, no, that's, that's something you keep for yourself. You know, you don't ever let anybody else use your phone. And if they do, they're spying on you. Uh, you know, these, these were very personal uh, devices. And so uh, it's, it, it, it's interesting to see how our relationships with, the technology have changed so much, you know, as far as, uh, you know, the, 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 the fractionality of the relationships, you know, it's like, there's the eye screen versus iPhone versus I, I, I laptop. <laughs> totally. And I do want to make sure we only have about 10 minutes left. I want to make sure to talk about your sub stack. It's so great. And why did you start it? What, what made you decide to start a sub stack? I, I don't know. It, it was one of those things that uh, it, I think what 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 it ended up being was uh, I was getting more and more interested in academic approaches to the occult um, and and this kind of burgeoning field and also feeling a little left out because there's there's two sides. There's the practitioner and there's a scholar. Uh, and so the etic and emic sides, if you will, and uh, there were there were things there were definitely conventions and things associated for uh, for scholarly practitioners. They're small, but there's SWE and all these uh, different con uh, conferences. They exist, and there's always been practitioners. But what happens if you're a practitioner that's interested in these uh, uh, scholarly? I mean, are you supposed to go back and get a PhD in religious studies or anthropology? You're or right whatever? for the Fenris Wolf. <laughs> yeah, but right for the Fenris. So, well, and I think that uh, the Fenris Wolf is a great example of, in a way, an old fashioned idea where you had, like, you know, the, the in the Victorian times, you had the you know, scholarly gentleman scholar kind of uh, kind of archetype where you had this guy that, you know, is a, well, you know, Gerald Gardner is a perfect example. It's like, you know, it's like his retired civil servant decides to start a religion, you know, and uh, and, and writes a lot of stuff and reads a lot of stuff. And uh, where is that in our society? Uh, where is that? Where is that archetype? And yeah, you see, uh, because the people that are creating a lot of content if they want it to sell it has to be in very short form so so youtube videos or you know substack's a good example my stuff is an average of four minute read <laughs> and uh, and uh, you know there there isn't a lot of uh room in our society for long form narratives and uh and so i i just wanted to do something almost as a practice so it's like this is what a thinking of I mean, maybe i'll turn it into some kind of a larger thing a book or something at some point but yeah, for now collect just, them uh, together yeah i i just uh i'd like i'd like to talk about you know the idea of the bridge dweller the archetype of the bridge dweller has always been very important to me uh because i literally grew up in a border town and was literally a bridge dweller but but also i've always felt uh stuck between two different things and so in in studying, in studying uh, occultism, there's there's a certain there's a large part of that is studying yourself, and and those around you, um, and I I I think that this is this is a new and interesting area. But there's a, just like, you know, at one time the amateur scientist was a big deal. You know, like you'd have the uh, you know magazines like. Uh, um, uh, amateur physics or whatever or uh, uh, there there would be uh that you could buy in a grocery store you know <laughs> and uh and uh, uh, uh or amateur electronics and uh, and so you see this maker movement now that uh, that has uh, sprung up over the last couple of decades uh i think that that's a re response to that uh and and so th there was an article actually um 
years ago, I don't remember who wrote it in uh, in Make Magazine, that uh, it, it was just kind of a rant to this, like how uh, all, all the makers should join the Masons because, you know, then you would have DIY Freemasonry and it would be so cool. Uh, and uh, and, and I, I think that, that this is a little bit of a response to that. I think that there needs to be more of a, a DIY aesthetic to uh, esoteric study and uh, because, you know, as a librarian, you know, my my job is to uh, help connect people with what they're looking for. Uh, and and that's what this is about uh, in, in a way, too, because uh, there are many, many sources of uh, of information out there. But precious few good ones mm -hmm. uh, uh, where you, you, if you if you and you and you have to also figure out what you want so many people lack the basic uh, understanding of how academia works uh and you know i've been an academic librarian for 20 over 20 years now i graduated in 2000 um and uh and so i i've learned a lot about how what's important to faculty for to librarians to academic librarians to provosts and it's not all the same thing you know <laughs> it's uh you know uh, I, i'm part of uh Angela Puka's uh, Patreon or whatever. So we have a very active Discord. And, uh, and one of the things that keeps coming up is, you know, there are people that want to study uh, these academic subjects, but they're intimidated by the learning curve. It's like, because some of them are so specialized that, yeah, unless you, you know, it's like, what, what do you, what do you mean the translation isn't, isn't good enough that you have to learn ancient Greek in order to actually study this or whatever. Um, and so I don't know. I, I think that uh, part of that is my own floundering about trying to figure these things out for myself. And maybe I can help somebody else who's, you know, wanting to go into this stuff a little bit more that, you know, it's like is frustrated with, you know, just a beginner's guide to blank, 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 <laughs> you know, and, uh, but they're not quite ready for, uh, you know, what it's, it, it's funny because if you scholars, in print sound very intimidating uh and i think they're they're supposed to right you know it's like a, but but if you go to these conferences and or listen to lectures online it's like you suddenly realize yeah they're they're kind of just goofy people uh and they, they, they're they're just lucky enough to be studying something they're really passionate about uh for the most part and and if you just listen to them, the conversations are interesting, much more so than than really the subject they're studying. It's like, you know, why do you find uh, the 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 discourse between Iamblichus and, uh, and somebody else, uh, you know, interesting? It's like, what? Why that is like? Well, you know, it it all goes down to this, and and inevitably, if you ask the right questions, uh, they're quite accessible and you know their their motivations are in many ways very simple you know they just find cool stuff and want to study it <laughs> absolutely and um i think yeah i love that there's a i mean especially when i first learned about it i think a lot of people don't even know like how much it's growing this like kind of study in academia of alternative religions and the occult and things like that and in a lot of ways it's really great but what i'm worried about that i see happening for a lot of people is like a lot of these people i know at some point were practitioners and then they become like they, they were interested in it for like a reason and then once they start studying it it becomes more like abstracted and then they seem to kind of like move away like almost like the practitioners are kind of like you know that's not that's not sophisticated to be practicing it it's more sophisticated to kind of be studying it and looking at it and it seems to like like this teacher that I was saying like you know oh psychoanalytic theory is really great for studying literature but like don't do the practice it kind of seems like that way where like the practice is put on like a lower level than the like academic study of the content and it's like but you wouldn't even be studying anything if the practitioners didn't exist <laughs> and I know a lot of you used to be practitioners so like why dissociate that part of yourself but I think also academia like they want to be respected in the institution the academy so it's like they're kind of 
encouraged to distance themselves from the practice and just be looking at it, you know? And I think that's really unfortunate. And yeah, because it's obviously a lot of like smart people and great minds and people who are passionate and have a lot of energy to do a lot of work. Um, so that makes me kind of sad to see like the, the practice being kind of dis more dismissed in place of the like study of the practice. Yeah, well, certainly the norm uh, within academia is you have to be socially distant to a certain extent. Uh, you you have to be removed from what you are studying. Um, you can't be immersed in it. So the, this the, this is uh, in in some field it's relatively straightforward and easy. It's like physics. Well, yeah, you have a you have a, a distance from what you're studying and. Uh, Although that's breaking down every day, <laughs> you know, but yeah, uh, and I would argue as an analyst, there's always a reason why you're drawn to what you're drawn to studying. So you're it, never really like that objectively distanced from it. Cause like, why, like, why are you studying Satanism in academia? For example, like it's not because you're just objectively want to look at this thing. Like something that's like drawing you to that subject, you know? Well, it, it's like the whole, uh, all, almost all theolog professional theologians are atheists you know because you know you get into it it's like well you have to leave your personal beliefs at the door uh but uh, but but the, but i do think there are su some subjects that are more welcoming to this like art is probably the best example like they're weirdos to begin with they expect a certain weirdness from them so you have somebody like jesse bransford who can be a chair of and my department and and all, and all this stuff and still write uh, this book of ooh these, these kooky drawings that I did while doing dream research with uh, with this other guy from from across the world and uh, visiting Iceland it's like yeah that's so cool that you can do both uh as opposed to a lot of religious studies scholars who you know book is a perfect example of, will only cite peer reviewed research will will not say how well, how they personally think how they personally view it and so it, it's it's hard it, it's just, it's just hard and but uh but I, well, keep I, I writing yeah keep contributing <laughs> your ideas send carl something for fenris wolf oh sure if, if you if, if you think it might have anything worth publishing but yeah. i do okay <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, well, thank you so much for, for, for interviewing me. This is a great pleasure. Yeah, it was so fun to talk to you, and you'll have to come back again. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. All right. Bye. All right. Bye.